So today I'm going to be talking about creativity, scientific creativity largely, and I would be very interested in hearing your thoughts at the end, because this is a paper that I work on a couple of years ago, but actually I took it then as a more as a side project and really I didn't um I haven't presented like in front of the of an audience uh, properly. So now that I'm thinking that maybe there can be a follow-up paper from these with a colleague, it would be really helpful to hear your comments about the arguments here, how you think they can be improved, expanded in some way. Okay, so basically the aim of this talk um, is to offer some form of resources uh, to help spell out how I think creative instances in science and with creative instances in science, I'm thinking about creative hypotheses, creative methodologies, creative scientific models are specifically in which specific sense they are valuable. We can say they are valuable, but maybe perhaps in which other sense they might not be so, so valuable. And just to clarify, uh, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the contemporary debate in philosophy of creativity. And um, you should know that most of the people who have been engaged in this debate um, mainly work and originally have been working in aesthetics and in philosophy of art much more than in philosophy of science. So these come across often in the type of um, um, in the way in which they build their arguments, use their examples and somehow what I'm trying to do here by bringing together this debate on creativity with some uh, analysis on this notion of pursuit, scientific pursuit that I'm going to incorporate, I'm somehow like uh, adopting some methodological framework that assumes that certain problems, including I think the problem of cre creativity, can be most fruitfully uh, addressed at the intersection, I think, between philosophy of science and aesthetic, uh, at least provided that there is some form of methodological systematicity in the way you combine the interests of people who are originally discussing one field with the other. Okay, let me see this. I can move my, mm -hmm. I don't know, let me, oh, here. okay, so the, the, the structure of the talk is very straightforward. First, I'm going to present you with what is considered to be the standard view on creativity in the recent debate in the philosophy of creativity. Then I'm going to present a couple of arguments that have uh, criticized this standard view. And I'm going to tell you that I don't think these arguments are very convincing, but still they raise some worries about the standard view that I think we need to incorporate. Um, and the way I'm, I will try to incorporate these worries is by appealing to the notion of pursuit work worthiness in, in philosophy of, um, of science. And I will refer, I hope I have time to refer at the end, to one particular example, which is what I think is a very creative scientific hypothesis in the contemporary earth sciences, which is the Anthropocene hypothesis, and tell you why I think the characterization that I'm going to give um, helps understand cases. So, we can say that the most widely adopted definition of creativity in the contemporary philosophical debate says that creativity is the ability, in some cases, um, the disposition to produce novel and valuable objects. Um, or if we focus on the analysis of those objects instead of the ability or disposition that produces them, then we would say that creative products um, are those that fulfill two necessary and sufficient conditions, which are novelty and value. Um, okay, so this standard view of creativity can be traced back to Kant in the Critic of Judgment, where he defines the creative genius as someone who produces works that are both original and exemplary. And in the recent uh, philosophy of creativity, this standard view has been endorsed, among others, by Stenberg and Lubar, and notably by Margaret Bowden and others such as uh, Betty Scout as well. So this standard view of creativity uh, appears to capture, actually, um, uh, crucially, how we employ the concept of creativity in our everyday talk. So from moments when we for instance, praise a child as being creative for producing a whimsical drawing to encounters with artworks that surprise us or to occasions when we celebrate a new scientific invention, we seem to refer to certain objects and ideas that are both novel and valuable as creative. 
And also think about um, the way in which creativity is treated by governing regulatory or educational organizations. You have some quotes here that reinforce this idea that being creative is something highly valuable. And from now on, I'm going to focus in the value condition, in the standard view of creativity. I'm going to leave for now the novelty condition aside uh, and to highlight how this value is um, um, is um, um, stress no, in these common definitions. For instance, the UNESCO says that um, they regard creativity as a major component, not only of a spiritual life, but also of the material and economic life of persons and populations. Uh, also, the European Commission has this program called um, Creative Europe, uh, which defines and um, praises creativity in similar terms. Um, and to this, we can add that this similar praise for creativity seems to be very ingrained in many accounts of the past that we have been commonly, I think, uh, exposed to. So, for instance, many conventional histories of science and conventional histories of art often describe how there are some greatest um, individuals in different domains that exemplify extraordinary creativity. Think about examples, typical examples, Einstein, Da Vinci, that possess this creative, this gift of the creative genius that allows them to produce exceptionally novel and valuable works. Okay, with all these um, common definitions, you can imagine that it's not surprising not to, to see that there have been suspicions um, about these attributions of special or exceptional uh, value to create individual and objects. For instance, it's true that also in more recent approaches in the history of science and in STS, this idea of the creative genius has been criticized as an unhelpful myth altogether for being some sort of reconstruction of the past um, focus on some supposedly extraordinary individuals that doesn't really account um, for how actual uh, scientific practices work in a commun communal uh, way. Um, but also this myth uh, seems to hamper the project of naturalizing creativity in the sense of making it also an ability that take place in ordinary uh, everyday practices, for instance, in, in problem solving activities. Okay. Um, so in the, the criticisms I want to focus more attention to here are the ones that have been formulated in recent years by philosophers Alison Hills, um, Alexander Bird. They um, criticize, and in particular, the inclusion of a value condition in the standard view on creativity, and they propose that this condition needs to be removed, and they offer their own alternative, which I'm not going to to get into, but I want to show what type of arguments they present to say that we have to remove the novelty, sorry, the, the value condition from the characterization of creativity. Basically, what they are saying is that this standard view promotes an unreflective approval of creativity, which is already widespread, but that they think is deeply misguided. Um, and here, I'm going to show you the two main arguments that they present. Okay. So the first argument they give is that creative people can produce both good and bad ideas. So it's possible that creative people to manifest their creativity, so one and the same disposition, not different disposition, in producing ideas that are good, that are valuable, and others ideas that are worthless, that are valueless. Uh, they give as an example, um, the, 19, the work of the 19th century astronomer and physicist, William Herschel, they point out how Herschel discovered the planet Uranus and also infrared, infrared um, radiation. But also, they say, he also had entirely false ideas about other planets. For instance, about the surface of the moon that he seemed to describe as if it was like an English countryside. Or he talked about how cold the surface of the sun would be. So... Hills and Bird conclude from there that it's simply not possible that one and the same set of disposition, including creativity, could produce the good ideas, but then we have another set of dispositions that are responsible for those bad ideas. What we need is um, to think about creativity as allowing sometimes to produce objects of value and other times 
objects of no value. So we have to endorse a valueless definition of creativity um, instead of including um, this value. Okay. So um, certainly, if we want to keep the standard view on creativity, I think we do need to make sense of the fact that for sure, artists and scientists have very unfortunate ideas sometimes. Uh, but I think the key here is to pay attention to how Hills and Burr, what they actually mean when they talk about producing bad and good ideas in this context. And um, the truth is that the way they characterize um, these good and bad ideas and use examples in science uh, make us notice that what they do is to identify a good idea with a true idea, a true statement, and a bad idea with a false one, one that results in a false statement such as about the surface of the of the sun in this case um so what i think is that we don't need to endorse this way of understanding the value condition in the um standard view of creativity um, as um valuable in the sense of true or um having of uh, of increasing the possibilities of um, an idea to be to be true, but still we can keep um, the value condition specified in more concrete uh, terms. So, in fact, not only uh, this what calls uh, what we should um, um, what it should call our attention to is the fact that as it is until now um, um, defined, this value condition has um, it's um, extremely vague. Um, um, and unspecify, and this can lead to um, um, confusing, erroneous misattributions of values um, to creative objects. So more generally, I think we shouldn't understand this value condition as meaning value, valuable, something is valuable in general, or valuable simpliciter, as Veris Gaud uh, says. What we need is to find a much more specific uh, way of saying that creative instances are valuable in a specific way, which is what I'm going to try to do. In, and in this specific way, I think we could give a characterization of Herschel's creative ideas about infrared um, radiation in similar terms, so recognizing similarly a value in them um, in a similar way than his ideas, uh, creative ideas about the surface of the moon or the, or the, or the sun where. Yeah. And of course, this has no name. Just, so um, just to get the, the line of thought. So uh, when when Bert and his colleague somehow pick up uh, the definition uh, of creativity, and then they somehow seem to presuppose that they equate value, value with truth. Um, OK, you can do that. But like uh, you, you, you have given us the very first definition that creativity consists in uh, the uh, production of novel and valuable objects or ideas. Um, haven't, haven't, hasn't, hasn't it been the case that these people who has pro provided, uh, who has given this definition, did they specify in any way what they meant by mm -hmm. uh, valuable and, mm -hmm. and novelty? Because Mm -hmm. If they did not, anybody can jump on, on this, this mm -hmm. alleged definition, mm -hmm. refine it in his or her way, and then someone will make up any objection for the position. Mm -hmm. um, Starting from an inside definition uh, creates a, a, a huge like, um, chamber of yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Which um, is unfortunate in my way. In my view. But I don't know the the, the line the the, the, the debate. The, the, yeah. The, so this is the thing, right? Like, um, it's clear that um, they talk very commonly to this uh, um, um, standard view, uh, using this very vague uh, general concept of value yeah. without being specified. But then you find a specific proposal. You find, for instance, in the fifties, Stein talks about novelty and value in the sense of useful or tenable. Mm -hmm. Amaville in the 90s talk about novelty and then the value is specified as again useful, appropriate, right? Depending on the account. Okay. But it's true that it's always left 
um, in, yeah. in very broad terms. So it really invites that people, as you just said, no, like Bird and Hill say, well, but look what is valuable in science. In science, something that is valuable is that you produce a true idea. And this person is producing something that is creative, but it's not true. So they 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 highlight um, the, the 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 increase of knowledge, right, of producing new true beliefs as the most genuine way in which you are producing something valuable in science. And they, it, it it doesn't match with the with the standard definition. That's why they see a problem there. So this is um, just like a very straightforward response from me of saying, look, you are identifying the value condition in this way. We don't have to. But the, the, the real problem is that no one has tried to be very specific about why it should be defined in a particular way. No, it opens um, for many. Yeah. But yeah, good, yeah. One, one tiny thing. Um, for Bird, it's not a coincidence that he signals out truth um, I exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, is, I know. You may know about the yeah, this brother, yeah, yeah, yeah. The great, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, no, of, of scientific progress. Yeah, it's true. Justified beauty is what science aims yeah. at. So it's not. And it's, it's, it's based yeah. on the science itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the funny thing is that at some point in this paper, they do say, well, you, we don't have to be thinking about truth the whole time. I didn't want to bring that in. Yeah. We can be thinking about understanding, but something, sometimes also when you um, find out that something is false, you can learn from it because you eliminate it and then keep going. So they are really not giving value <laughs> to anything that is not truthful, no, or truth conducive at least. So... Um, um, anyway, here, what I want to encourage is that we need to find a more precise definition of this value condition. The second argument that they present is that creativity actually can produce objects of wholly negative value. So here they wouldn't be focusing on the disposition or ability um, for creativity, but on the objects themselves that are that are creative. Um, and they are also don't seem to be thinking with wholly negative value on the epistemic sense we just discussed. So they are not thinking about false um, uh, false ideas. They are thinking here about um, morally questionable ideas. It's, so again, this invites us to think how this value condition has been incredibly unspecified no, and inviting all kinds of arguments and counterarguments. So this is basically what they are saying. They are appealing to these cases that are discussed in the philosophy of creativity as um, dark creativity or malevolent uh, creativity. What, what these cases suggest is that um, things that we sometimes recognize as creative, such as committing a crime, murdering, producing torture instruments, or carrying out um, reprobable, um, reprobable actions, um, we consider them creative, right? Uh, so for instance, Cropley, among others, have been discussing um, as like a notorious recent case of dark creativity, the or contemporary case, the attacks of 9-11. Uh, and this is an image of the example that G Hills and Bird give, uh, which is a creative way of executing people during the French Revolution that was called the Republican marriage, by which um, a male prisoner and a female prisoner would be bound together naked and then thrown into the river. So seeing this type of cases, um, um, they they say, well, creativity can put can be put um, uh, to work in doing bad and wrong acts. Um, so it cannot be a disposition to produce object, objects that have objective uh, value. Uh, we should therefore endorse a value-free definition of creativity um, and eliminate that value condition. Okay, so different um, philosophers in this debate have tried to address this challenge of dark creativity. For instance, Novich has talked about, uh, has said that maybe these cases are not really cases of creativity. They are cases of something else, some form of ingenious destruction, or properly, for instance, have... Um, said that cases of dark creativity like the attacks of 9-11 are valuable but only in the restricted sense that for a small group of people like the hijackers they were um, morally commendable acts and there have been other ways of trying to um, to respond to this challenge but always like trying to avoid which I think 
would be the most adequate way actually to address this challenge, to try to avoid to say that when we actually um, make creativity attribution to these cases, we are in a very restricted sense, but we are attributing them some form of value. And that is precisely why it is highly uneasy. We feel very uneasy. We feel very uncomfortable in verbally saying why we think that cases like these are creative because we are in fact attributing them some form of, of value. Now that doesn't mean we need to share in any way the views of the perpetrators or approving the consequence of the criminal acts, but um, and, and but we are, as I say, in a restricted way, somehow attributing them an aval a value. So I'm making here the same point. We need to spell out how uh, creative instances are valuable, but also we have to keep in mind that, of course, there are many, there's a plurality of values that can be playing uh, a role in assessing certain specific cases like this, or cases in science, or cases in, in art. And with a plurality of values, uh, a meaning, epistemic, aesthetic, uh, moral values, but also within these groups, there are a plurality of ways in which things can be epistemically valuable, for instance. So even if we recognize that we are attributing certain epistemic value in some way to evil acts like this, we can admit that at the same time, uh, we can be attributing them uh, multiple others and stronger negative um, values of a moral, social, um, and even also epistemic Kind. Okay, so the the, the the result of this brief analysis that I tried to present is that um, the value condition of the explanation of creativity is very informative and it can easily give rise to misattribution of unwarranted merits to creative products and creative people. And we need to address this last lack of clarity because I think that as a matter of fact, we do attribute some form of merits um, to things that we call uh, creative. Okay, so now I'm going to go um, present you with the way I think would be more convenient to characterize, further spell out, narrow down that value condition, um, which is that I think that the value of creativity should be uh, presented as a prospective type of uh, of value that is not as a hi, as a form of epistemic value that those objects have possess in their current state in the present in their current form right now but as a prospective type of value and here is when i am then incorporated um, a discussion around the notion of pursuit worthiness to spell out that type of prospective uh, value. And I will be um, thinking about um, cases here in, in science um, mainly. So to be pursued worthy is to deserve to be further scrutinized, explore, develop further. Why is this a value at all, you could ask? Um, I think this is because to be pursued worthy, as I think creative instances are, is to be promising to exhibit a potential, to project an expectation of epistemic success into the future. So a creative scientific object might not have achieved a form of epistemic su success in the current form yet, in the form of accuracy, truthfulness, correctness, but it might present some form of epistemic success if further investigated in the future. Um, to say a little bit more about this notion of pursuit worthiness, although it seems you have been had in all also seminars around the notion, I know um, Patrick have been working on this for quite a while, but um, we are basically bringing in or trying to bring in um, the, the idea um, originally spelled out uh, by Larry Lodan of context of pursuit that he presented in the 70s, but that has been uh, further analyzed in, in, in the following decades by people like Nichols, McMullin, and in the last few years, especially by, um, for instance, uh, Shashelia and, and Strasser. With context of pursuit, Lodham aimed to conceptualize and observe 
middle phase or nether region, as he called it, between the stages of the generation of hypotheses in science, which are typically, which is typically um, identified with the context of um, discovery, and the acceptance of hypotheses taking place in the context of justification. So we could say that um, pursuit refers in a descriptive sense to a temporal stage of inquiry where hypotheses are under development and scientists are working on their formulation, on their articulation uh, refinement. But then in a normative sense, pursuit would be referring to a specific form of epistemic appraisal um, that scientists carry out where they decide whether certain theories or hypotheses or modeling techniques or methodologies as well, we could uh, expand um, the, the, the implications, are worthy of further investigation by a community. Um, and here... The distinction that is clear is, is, is key is that that exists between appraisals of pursuit and appraisals of acceptance. So the idea is that while accepting a hypothesis in science could be to regard it as true or as a well-established piece of knowledge, to pursue it would involve to investigate it further. This, the distinction between them is clear because a scientist can decide to accept a certain hypothesis with no interest in working in it and also the other way around to um to decide to um so it is not um it's not necessarily for a scientist who decides to further work on a hypothesis to to accept it um as Feyerabend, who was also engaged in this debate in the 80s said the lack of performance and adequacy has never stopped people from pursuing ideas that they regard as important. No, and theories, we know they might present multiple anomalies in their current formulation as to um, um, accept them, and still they might be wanting to further investigate them. Okay, so I think making explicit this distinction between appraisals of acceptance and pursuit helps to see the implications that saying that pursuit worthiness is the way in which creative instances are valuable. So we are not saying that something creative has value in the sense of having in the present certain form of epistemic success, like um, being true or having higher uh, possibilities of being true. Um, so it, being creative does not help science, does not give scientists reasons to accept the hypothesis, but only to give reasons to decide to keep investigating them. Right. So now the next question would be, okay, we have said that being pursuit worthy is projecting a form of epistemic success into the future. What would be those future um epistemic fruits, right, that we are going to, to get. Um, we have, for instance, the proposal by Cecilia and Strasser saying that the future fruits that we might uh, recollect would be uh, explanatory power, um, inferential density, cons uh, consistency. Mark Mullin talks about this potential capacity of a certain hypothesis of handling problems in the future if we keep uh, working on it. Um, and for instance, we see focus on, on a specific case studies, the interesting proposal by Patrick and his colleague, where they um, uh, they focus on the theory of cosmic inflation and they talk about the promises of certain theories to, in the future, um, managing to unify um, 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 unify different proposals, different um, um, theories to give better explanations in the future or to provide more understanding in the future. Right, so then what is what is genuine? What is different with, with creative hypotheses in science, with creative instances? How are they pursued worthy in a way that might be different than other um, instances that are other hypotheses that are still pursuit worthy, but are not creative. And, and I think that here, the key is to look at the other um, necessary condition in the in the standard view of creativity, the novelty condition we, we have left aside until now. 
Um, and to highlight that what we are um, we have uh, here is an entanglement of the two um, conditions. So we should be we should understand them as working together, not just as two ju just opposed conditions. So this entanglement of the novelty and pursuit worthiness condition results in creative objects, I think, that have the quality of calling attention to certain overlooks, overlooked unexplored aspects of the epistemic tradition in which these objects, these creative objects have been uh, produced, are embedded, and bring those elements, overlooked elements of the past to the fore of the research. So it is the novel revisitation of topics, of approaches, of, of techniques of the past, of a field, what concedes this programmatic character to creative hypothesis. Or to put it in other words, I think that creative hypotheses negotiate the transition between the past of an inquiry and the prospects of it in the future more explicitly and more richly than non-creative hypotheses do it, even if these other non-creative hypotheses might be worth pursuing for other, given other features that they might have, right? So what I'm doing here basically is to introduce in some form of temporal or diachronic component in the definition, the standard view of creativity in a way mm, mm, that is more explicit than uh, previous attempts to, to, to define the phenomenon of of creativity. Um, so I'm just going to move to a, a specific example. I don't know how I'm doing with time, uh, but a bit, uh, maybe I'm, I'm talking too much. Okay, so I'll just be, um, I'll try to be uh, brief. Um, um, so here I'm, I have two quotes by Noel Carroll, who, who is a philosopher um, of art, whose proposal I think very much goes in line um, with what I'm trying to do here, even if he doesn't explicitly tries to spell out this um, characterization of the novelty condition in terms of pursued worthiness. So the, uh, for me, this is a good example of how um, accounts have, be, have been developed thinking about scientific cases in philosophy of science very much can inform um, proposals in philosophy of art, but also the, the other way around. Look what Noel Carroll says when he tries to define what a creative artwork is. He says, he says that a creative artwork recombines elements and concerns of the tradition in a specially deft, original, and insightful way, so that it allows us to see afresh that tradition that we thought that we knew so well. This goes very much in line to the characterization of value as pursued worthiness, because he says that when we um, call certain artworks creative, we are issuing a promissory note, a bet that it will be fruitful, given the clarity they have already brought to the tradition. So we suppose reasonably that that clarity will have consequences. And this reasonably is fundamental, right? We ma we being creative in certain contexts, um, adopting creative hypotheses or creative methodologies uh, will be reasonable insofar as they are with good reasons, um, giving us good reasons to say that they might be fruitful, that they might be um, fertile in the, in the future if further investigated. Okay, so very briefly, I will present you with an example that I think helps um, exemplify how creative products in science are qua creative, valuable in the sense of pursuit worthiness, entangled to, a, to the novelty element. So I'm sure you have heard um, about the Anthropocene hypothesis in the earth sciences, um, and these hypotheses, it's common to hear um, assessments of it as a remarkable case of uh, scientific creativity. Mm, what this hypothesis um, um, uh, uh, proposes is that the beginning of a new geological epoch has already occurred, um, and it has as a distinctive feature the central role that humankind um, is playing in it. 
and it was um, originally uh, formulated by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer in the year 2000. What they say in this article from, uh, from 2000 is that major the major and still growing impact of human activities on the earth and the atmosphere demand the conceptualization of this new geological time unit for them with onset in the 18th century industrialization period, although um, other uh, refinements of the hypothesis would situate this start of the Anthropocene in the mid 20th century. Um, so um, this uh, Anthropocene hypothesis could contribute to better investigate this overwhelming observation that mankind will remain a major geological force for many millennia, possible millions of years. But it also will encourage keeping it, adopting it, the development of uh, sustainability strategies in the face of these human-induced stresses on the ecosystem. Now, I think this is a very illustrative case of how appraisals of pursuit and appraisals of acceptance come apart. On the one hand, what we have is that since this um, hypothesis was um, presented um, in Crutzen's and Sturman's um, publication, the, it has been thoroughly scrutinized by multiple scientific communities, way beyond stratigraphy. That was the field where it was in that context of that field where it was produced. So then it became um, spread in the earth system sciences and then also even in the social sciences. And it's been discussed, you will, you have seen not everywhere, but then you have you find um, how even new journals have been launched uh, to be working around the um, Anthropocene hypothesis specifically. And then you have other prestigious journals such as Nature and, and Science telling you that they are encouraging the scientific community to further examine it. So we can see how very clearly this hypothesis has passed appraisals of pursuit for the time being in the last 20 years, right? Very clearly. But then we have this other side of the story, which is that the Anthropocene hypothesis actually hasn't formally passed appraisals of acceptance. Um, and this is a peculiar case because um, there is a, um, an official arbiter in these cases for the identification of units of geological time, which is the International Commission on Stratigraphy. So within this commission, an Anthropocene working group was established they were responsible of gathering all the available um, empirical evidence to examine whether the hypothesis should be um, accepted or not. And so far, it hasn't been um, accepted. Last time that happened, if you remember, beginning of this year, when we had um, the, the, the case of the sediment drill core taken from the bottom of the Crawford Lake um, in, in Canada, which was supposed to be taken as this um, very um, solid global marker where you see these layers indicating that you can identify, identify there where um, which um, layers were formed around the mid 20th century and how there are some plutonium particles in them. But it has been so far rejected, right? There, there are go going to be other new attempts of keeping gathering evidence and trying to accept the, the hypothesis. Why, so what was the reason why um, this hypothesis hasn't been officially uh, accepted? The idea is that geological epochs um, have been traditionally defined based on the stratigraphic evidence, that is the traces on the lithosphere, which is the rigid uh, rocky outer layer of, of the earth. So the International uh, Commission of Stratigraphy would only be willing to accept the hypothesis if comparable evidence to the one employed, for instance, for the identification of previous geological epochs, such as the Pleistocene, um, is found on rock, glacier ice, or marine sediments. And at the present, for them, there isn't an unmistakable uh, datable marker on the lithosphere, even if they, of course, could recognize that there is um, traces of human activities at the interfaces of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere. 
Okay, so following the previous characterization, and I'm finishing here, um, the creativity of the Anthropocene hypothesis can be spelled out as an entanglement of novelty and pursued um, worthiness. And we could say that it is a, 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 a hypothesis that illuminates some overlooked aspects of the epistemic tradition in geological uh, research and by doing that, in virtue of doing that, they art it articulates a promise about the future potential future benefits of um, adopting it um, and keep investigating it. So, in which ways it um, it um, highlights bring, brings to the fore aspects that have been overlooked of the of the of the tradition in in earth science research. Um, so, on the one hand, it rehabilitates formulations um, in the past um, of geological time units in terms of, um, of uh, based on of human influence that have actually existed since the 18th century. And again, we find Lyell in the 19th century talking about a recent epoch of the earth that should be um, defined in terms of the emergence of civilizations. And then again, in the early 20th century, we find a similar one. So this Anthropocene hypothesis calls attention to those past intuitions that have not been spelled out enough about the humans being non-passive observers of the Earth functionally. But it also illuminates overlooked aspects of how in the past um, um, geological epochs have been determined. Um, turning them now into open questions that can be either revised or further substantiated. For instance, the Anthropocene hypothesis has encouraged the revision of how actually global markers are defining the beginning of geological units of time, uh, appealing to the adoption of more flexible, perhaps, identification of those global markers. All right, so, um, okay, I think I'm leaving it there and just jumping to the conclusions to say that what I've been trying to do here was to bring together in what I hope is somehow helpful way contemporary literatures on creativity and on the notion of pursuit. I have been trying to say that creative objects shouldn't be recognized as valuable in general or valuable simplicity, but in a much more and also not valuable in the sense of exhibiting forms of epistemic success in the present, in, in, in their current form, but um, that they should be um, assumed to, to have some uh, prospective type of value that is entangled with, um, with a form of novelty. Um, this characterization of the value condition of creativity I think can help account for different situations that we might encounter in science. Situations we, when actually having a encountering a new creative um, object, a new creative hypothesis or model, might be the most convenient thing to adopt adopt in a particular case. For instance, when we are in a cognitive stagnant situation or we want to escape some epistemic uh, inertia that blocks the way in which we are studying a phenomenon, it might be rational in these cases to adopt those creative um, um, hypotheses uh, because um, it is illuminating um, the and, and um, overlook aspects of the traditionally and would have um, that could potentially be illuminating for the field. But there might be other cases where that might not be the case. And what we need are certain models, hypotheses, methodologies that present in their current form, some form of epistemic um, uh, virtues. And creative hypotheses might not be the ones that, um, that are bringing those, um, um, are helping us in those cases. Okay, and just lastly, I think that the commonalities we find between certain ways of um, of thinking, attributing value to creative instances in both in art and sciences, um, uh, invites us to think that maybe even if I didn't try to be like a, some form of comprehensive account of creativity that can actually uh, explain all instances of creativity, I think there is 
in principle enough commonalities to to think that such an account might be possible if further developed. And I'll finish here. Thank you.